right through to the book of Revelation shortly, um, which I know you're looking forward to. I'm not, actually, <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. Anybody else wants to preach that Sunday, that's fine. Let me know. Um, but we will do it. Today is an amazing book of the Bible. I have struggled this week to try and contain the message that I want to share with you from the book of Hebrews this week. An amazing book of the Scriptures. Let's pray. Father God, give me help this morning. Help me to capture the essence of this amazing teaching in your Word. Help us to listen and to open our ears to new things and to be stimulated and and encouraged and exhorted with the truths that are contained in here in this book, amazing book of Hebrews, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Some of the great verses in the book of Hebrews, and I know this is very special for those in this church for you. I think it was over here somewhere. I don't know. I wasn't here. But it was round the church. And by the way, it's going back up, that, that text. It's going back up. It will be returned probably going to be in the cafe in a very prominent area. And this is the verse, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's special to you, uh, and, and this is found in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Um, I don't know when it's going back up. We need to get it sorted, but it will be returning, uh, as Jesus will as well, by the way. But anyway, we won't go there. Um, we'll get it done before he comes back, all right? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The great chapter of faith is in the book of Hebrews, and I want to finish my message today talking about faith. Um, the last six books of the Bible um, actually have a clear theme running through them, which is through suffering to glory. It's not that encouraging, actually, when you think about it, through suffering to glory. And it reminds us at the outset that our pathway we tread is not an easy one. It is rocky, it is steep, and there are obstacles and oppositions that stand in our way. There are unexpected trials that happen to us as happened to Jess. All right, Remember that illustration that we prayed for this morning, Jess? And many of you know that you're walking along following God and all of a sudden you hit a wall. And trials and problems come to us. We are not immune from obstacles and trials and difficulty. Just because we're Christians, we're not sheltered from problems in life. And I want you to grasp that very clearly as we start this morning to look at the book of Hebrews because it is the essence of this book. And so I've called my message today, Don't Give Up on Jesus. Because many of us are, are challenged at times about what happens in our lives and we go, where were you, God? Where were you when that happened, when Jess fell over and hit her head and had a brain injury? Why didn't you stop her? Why didn't one of your angels just kind of reach down and, and, and kind of put her back on her feet? Where were you? Don't give up on Jesus when things happen in your life that are difficult, trials, unexplained challenges. And that's my message today. Let me share a few things about this book of Hebrews. First of all, uh, just kind of got to put your, your, your I'm going, you're going to Bible school today a little bit, all right, you ready? Okay, you know, so often, and Hebrews says this, we're so used to all the kind of, you know, usual teaching about the gospel, but, you know, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it, let's go deeper today. Let's ask some harder questions about the scripture. Uh, the last, um, th this book of Hebrews is written in a style of Greek that language is the language of the street. It is not written in classical Greek like many other books of the New Testament. And therefore the content is a bit like, or the material is a bit like a street preacher, okay? If you read, and I hope you did, the book of Hebrews this week, you'll probably come to the conclusion, like me, that it was written by a preacher. It's written by someone who's out there preaching and exhorting, because as you read it, there is this intensity and there's the flow of someone who's articulate and who's able to teach and encourage us. Um, most, most, uh, most people think that because of this, uh, it is not written by the Apostle Paul. It has a completely different style of Greek. And so I, I'm of the opinion that I don't know who wrote it. Uh, some people say Apollos might have written it. Uh, some people say that, um, you know, it could have been any number of people, but probably not Paul. Um, I, I, I don't think so, because the style of the Greek and the language is so different. You know, the other day I was down in Auckland City, and I walked past Fort Street, 
and I was reminding Judy that it was on Fort Street, on that corner of Queen Street and Fort, that I, as a young man, stood up and preached my first sermon or my first message. I, I was a street preacher. I was a street preacher. And I got up there on the corner of Fort Street and I shared my testimony. And I played music to a trumpet and a few other people. We had a lot of fun. But, you know, I got really used to hecklers and to people, uh, you know, standing up and challenging me when I was preaching. That's a pretty quiet, you bunch here. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a street preacher. I, I don't mind. Amen, bro. Thanks, Hemi. And, um, and, and that was where I came from. Um, and that is the essence of this book. It's a street preacher exhorting people to not give up on Jesus. Okay, got it? Okay, it is secondly the most Jewish of all New Testament books because it shows a clear link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament sacrificial system by which people were having their sins forgiven and the New Testament deal that Jesus has got for us, okay? So there's a complete link between these two and you are able to see that as a believer in Jesus that you link back to a previous system but you have superseded it. Did you get that? So, so the whole basis of our relationship with God through Jesus is linked to the Old Testament but it is also superseding it. it. It is much better. It is a new covenant. It is a better deal. Um, but God all along, amazing thing, planned for this to happen even though that happened. All right? Even though that happened, this was going to happen through Jesus and you are now the benefit of that. Okay? So you, you are linking through to the past. You are also linking through all the benefits to the, to the future of what. So the kind of, it, it's kind of, it's a linking kind of book. And it explains um, the relationship between Gentiles and Jews and the sacrificial system. Um, we don't know who wrote it. As I said, um, I think, though, the Holy Spirit inspired this amazing book. When was it written? Well, um, between A.D. 55 and A.D. 70, because the temple sacrifices were still happening when this book was written. And in A.D. 70, the temple was smashed. It was destroyed. It was pulled down by Emperor Nero, and he began persecuting people and followers of Jesus, and also Jews as well. But I'll explain a little bit more about that a bit later on. Um, it would only be a few years before Jesus' followers would have to declare Caesar is Lord or be martyred. Okay, here's a, here's a decision. You're a follower of Jesus? All right, you need to say these words, Caesar is Lord. Will you do it? No, I won't. Okay. Well, you're going to be martyred. So, you know, being a follower of Jesus was starting to cost you. It wasn't something that you could just do on Sundays. And, you know, you kind of say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus, and, and, but I'm a follower of whatever on any other day of the week. If you were a Christian, you were going to be seriously challenged in your faith. And um, why was the book of Hebrews written? Well, both Jewish and Gentile believers had become followers of Jesus. And they had to move their thinking and understanding of their faith. Let me explain. The Jew who had practiced temple worship had to stop doing that. You understand? There was a time when if you were a Jewish follower of Jesus, you had to stop visiting the temple and the synagogue. Why? Because that system had ceased in Jesus, right? So you have to start rethinking your faith. You have to start stop doing something and start believing a new deal. That's if you're a Jew. If you're a Gentile follower of Jesus and you've come to faith and you're not a Jew, then you have embraced this Jesus and you are linking with the Jewish heritage, okay? You can't ignore that. And so one of the things that I want to say to you today, whether you realize it or not, as you became a follower of Jesus, you buy into all the history of the Jewish nation. Do you realize that? You are grafted into and you are part of the history of the Jewish people. So, so the Gentile actually doesn't have to just think, well, you know, I'm, I'm just an add-on. You're actually not. You are, you are receiving the blessings that were received by the Jewish people that God had reserved from them, and then God says, and now all you people are welcome. And the book of Hebrews is the book that does this, okay? It links these two groups together and explains why they can become one people of this new way. But the main essence of the book of Hebrews is don't turn back. Don't give up on Jesus. Hebrews is not easy reading. The writer speaks of milk or meat, all right? So 
you know, milk is what you're used to. <laughs> milk is what we give to babies. And the milk of the gospel is all about who Jesus is, why he died for your sin. Pray a prayer and receive your salvation. That's the milk of the gospel. The meat of the gospel is understanding what's under that. What are you? Who are you? What have you received? What is your future? What is your entitlement? What is your blessing now? I mean, all this stuff is in the book of Hebrews and other books of the scriptures. So uh, Hebrews begins with all about who Jesus is. Now, what this is going to do, this is going to stretch your Christology. Your Christology is what you think about who Jesus is, all right? So when you go to theological college or Bible college, you will have a lecture on Christology. So I want to ask you this morning, and this is where you can give me some answers. I want to, I want to test your Christology. Now, this is, don't be embarrassed, right? All right. Okay, now here's the simple question. It's got many answers. Here's a clue. Who is Jesus? All right. Who's going to go first? Easiest answer first. Son of God, got it? All right, that's a good answer. He is the Son of God, and when you say that, you are saved. You're declaring Jesus to be the Son of God. He's more. Emmanuel, which is what? God. God with us. Jesus is God's visitor from heaven to earth in a human body. We celebrate that at Christmas. That's why the message of Christmas is the most incredible thing, that God didn't come riding in on a horse with a shield. He came as a baby, as a vulnerable human being. There's a message in there alone. Okay, who else is Jesus? Come on, let's go. Yep. The perfect Lamb of God, which means that he is, he is what? He is a sacrifice for sin. He is he's not just a human being. He, is, he came to do something. He came to die, basically, the Bible says. You know, no, what a great life. Okay? No, no, not. He came to die for our sin, and he is the perfect sacrifice for sin. Hebrews picks that up. Yep. He is the Messiah, which means that he is the coming one. He is the one that we have longed to wait for, and he has arrived, and he arrived in the year 2000 and dot, naught. All right? No, I didn't know. That's a ridiculous thing to say. He arrived, and, and he came at a point in time, and, and we're going to talk about that because that's the opening of where this whole story starts in Hebrews. Yep. He is the, anybody else? Yep. He is the what? The king of kings. Okay. Okay, he's, he is um, the king of a kingdom. He is bringing in a new deal, and the new deal is the kingdom of God. So previously, it sounds like, a, it sounds like a, you know, one of those things. I haven't even started my message today. Previously, uh, he, he, he revealed himself to, to Israel. He said, you're my special people. You're my people. I've chosen you. You're, you're my people. So declare who I am by the way you live, all right? And I'll sort the whole deal out where you can come to know me through the sacrificial system. So the Jewish nation were previously the, the best people on earth. They were God's special people. But he is the Messiah, and he is coming back. And the kingdom is now not just for them. It's for us. It's for every nation, every people, every tongue, every tribe on earth. And he is the king over all that. And so when Jesus came, his teaching was all about what? Kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is like this. And so he ushered in the new deal. And we live between the time when it was Jewish only. Kingdom of God starts with Jesus, king coming back, return of the king. All right? That has yet to happen unless I miss something. All right? Jesus is coming back in power and glory. Not as a baby. He's coming back as a king, as a ruler to reign. And we live in this middle bit now. That's where we are. Okay? Pretty good. We get all the benefits of that. But we, yep. Yep. High priest, okay, yeah, you know where I'm going, don't you? You're a very smart man. Um, he is our high priest. I will talk about that this morning. Yes? Prince of peace, he brings peace. Okay, now your Christology is pretty good, but you've missed something. And it was, I'm so glad you missed a whole bunch. Okay, quickly go, yep. Yep. Savior and friend, yep. Salvation, gospel, Who? what else we got? Yep. Who won? Light of the world, so he is light, and his message is light. Yep. Alpha, beginning and the end. So, so he is, he is kind of like, uh, there's nothing that wasn't before he was, and there's nothing after he's been, all right? So he, by the way, that is a really great thing to think about. Your Christology needs to have a beginning and an end, and Jesus doesn't. And so there is something amazing about Jesus' Christology that, that doesn't have a beginning or an end. More about that later. Yep. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. 
the way, the truth, and the life, gospel, New Testament, coming of the kingdom stuff. Yep, got it, right? Anyone else? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for something that hasn't come. Yeah. The Christ, the anointed one is the word the Christ. Yes, he's the, yep. He's the one? Vindicator. Now we're getting somewhere. All right, so, so these are activity words. These are theological words that have a whole history underneath them. The vindicator means someone who comes along and makes you right or puts you right with something that's wrong. Yep, yep. God with us, El Shaddai. We've had all that. We've, yep, yep. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to stop. You're doing pretty good, but guess what? You've missed something. You've missed a whole department. Yeah, yeah, no, we, no we, we've got that. We're going there. Okay, let's, let's see what the book of Hebrews adds to this. You are a run ruly bunch, aren't you? I'm feeling right at home today. Here, here's the beginning of Hebrews. In former times, God spoke to us through what? Prophets. You remember? This is how Hebrews start. He spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament, and he declared his message. And through the angels and the prophets, and then he came as a baby, and God's son came at the dot, dot, dot part, and he came to die, and he lived with us for that short period of time. And the book of Hebrews says, but in these last days, he has spoken through his son. Okay. So, and then it goes on to say that Jesus is the last message of God, okay? This is his final word. So what Hebrews does is it shows us the link between Jesus and the Hebrew people's past. God has got nothing more to say to this world. You know that. Okay, so, you know, in a sense that's true, that, that, that God has said everything in the person of Jesus. Formerly he spoke through prophets, he spoke through people who were anointed to bring a message, and then he's got a final message through Jesus, and he's come and he's done that, and then he's now got nothing more to say until his return. So, so then that implies this. Everything you need to know is being said. Okay, got that? Now, now just think about this. So everything you need to know for living life, for receiving truth, everything you need to know about yourself, everything you need to know about God and his world, is already being said. There's nothing more to be revealed from God's perspective about this world and about you. Wow. Okay, have a think about that. That is profound in a sense because every answer you need has been said. Every need you have has been met in the person of Jesus. Every query and question you've got has been declared and revealed in who Jesus was and how he lived and what he said and what he conveyed to the followers. Who followed him. In fact, it says in the Bible that everything you need to know is actually already in here. So our Christology gets stretched when we get to the book of Hebrews. And I, what, do I, what am I going to say? Look, here we go. When the people listened to who Jesus was and the preacher, let's call him the preacher of Hebrews, began to teach, the, co the focus was Jesus. And the first was, is Jesus greater than the angels? Because, because angels are God's messengers, and angels go and do amazing stuff, and we have seen angels do stuff. And, and, and angels are, well, no, he's greater than angels. Is, is Jesus greater than creation? Well, actually, he did it. He made this. And, and the maker must be greater than the thing he made. And so, so how big is Jesus? How, how, how big is your Christology? Is, is Jesus greater than this world and the amazing sunsets and, the, and all the life of the birds and the oceans and the sea and the sky and the stars. Yeah, he's greater. He's bigger than that. And then he goes on, it, well, is Jesus greater than Moses? I mean, Moses led the people through the desert. I mean, remember, he's talking to Jews here. Moses was the greater, greatest pin-up leader of all time. He had failures. He didn't do stuff sometimes very well, but he was the one who got them into the land. He got them free. And, 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 and how does Jesus... No, he's greater than Moses. Well, what about Abraham? Is Jesus greater than Abraham, the father of faith? Yes, he is. He's greater than Abraham. And so the opening of the book of Hebrews begins to lift the person of Jesus higher and higher, greater than creation, greater than Moses. Uh, Jesus, it says, is the cornerstone from which everything is measured and set in place. And if Moses got them out of Egypt, 
uh, Jesus gets us into the new land of God's promise. Greater than Abraham and the priesthood. So now you're telling me Jesus is greater than all those who have gone before. They were preliminaries to the main event. Yes, it's true. Even the father of faith, Abraham, bows the knee to Jesus and the protege, Melchizedek, who was a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. We don't have time to go there, but the story of Melchizedek had no beginning or no end. He is a type of Jesus. And then Abraham bowed to Melchizedek and gave him 10% of all he had. And therefore, Abraham recognized the authority of Melchizedek. And there is Jesus in the Old Testament as well. We don't have time to go into that, but there you go. That is an interesting story. So you can almost sense these listeners to this amazing story asking for more information, which says, if Jesus is the greatest, what did he do that exhibits his greatness? We know what Moses did. We know what Abraham did. We know what angels do, but what did Jesus do and what is he doing now that, that keeps his greatness current? Hebrews answers that. And we go on to Hebrews, the great high priest, chapters 5 to 10. Now, guys, here's something that we as Protestants are not too good at. When the Reformation happened, we threw out the priesthood. <laughs> um, you, know, you know what happened, eh? And the whole thing went belly up. It, it, it kind of got corrupt and, and uh, the Catholic Church was reformed and the Reformation happened and what we did is that we joined in with the Reformation and so we threw all the stuff out of the church, all the icons, all the everything and we started again with a bare building. Do you remember that? You weren't there. Okay, don't worry. It happened in 1500 and, and a bare building is what we, because we did not want to suffer the same indignity or the same temptation of the corruption of the Catholic Church. Okay? So we joined them with those people, and our birth heritage is those who were born into the Reformation movement, who began to worship God with buildings clear like this of icons, okay? We don't even have a cross. We, well, we, we do and we don't. That's controversial. won't go there. Anyway, um, it used to be there. It probably will be there one day. But we're learning now that the problem is not with the icons. The problem is how you attribute to it and what you believe it can do for you. The icon is to actually reflect your faith to God. It is no spiritual benefit in itself. Okay, you, um, <coughs> Human beings have got a very weird way of doing faith at times. They kind of attract some weird people who go, if I pray to that cross and to someone on the cross and I focus and pray enough, something good will happen. So they focus on the icon or the cross and not the Father, okay? That's where it goes wrong. We Baptists and re Reformers have gone to the other extreme, chucked everything out, and now we've kind of got bare buildings to worship in. And we need to remember that there is validity and assistance given to our faith when we worship with a cross or we worship with some kind of way of expressing our faith. We do it through music quite well, but we're not too good at anything else. Art? Art. Why don't we have more art? I'm, I'm way off my topic now, but I just want you to think for a minute about how we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater and how we need to be careful that we don't kind of just kind of go to the other extreme where we clear the buildings out and we make sure that we don't have any stumbling block. Mm, no, we can't do that. Now, Jesus is our great high priest, getting back to the message. When we threw out the priesthood with its corrupt practices in the Reformation, we then failed to understand what a priest does and how Jesus is our high priest. A priest stands between man and God. A priest is someone who offers sacrifice. A priest is an intermediary. A priest enters the highest holy place on behalf of others and is set aside for the special role. Now, within the priesthood, there is a hierarchy, and there was the top dog, and he was called the high priest. And, and once a year, he would go into the most holy place and he would make an offering for his own sin and then for the sin of the nation. Okay, you can read all about that in the Old Testament. Did you know that he had bells on his feet and a rope? Did you know that? And that and the, and the, the possibility that if he died when he went in that holy place, which could happen, it could seriously happen, uh, if the bells stopped ringing, they would pull him out by the rope. Yeah, true story. Have a read. 
uh, is just a bit unusual. But there you go. That was the severity or the, 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 the incredible uh, holiness of God and the humanity of man trying to meet. And, and here is what Jesus has done for us. You now don't need a high priest to go once a year into the holiest of holies with a bell on his feet and a rope and pulling him out. Because Jesus has done that. Jesus is our high priest who goes for the sin offering of his life before the Father and says, I will do this for my people once and for all time. He acts on our behalf, making peace with God the Father. And, and here's the difference. Not only does he act as the priest, he is the offering. Now, this makes his offering even better in that he is himself is the offering for sin. So his life is, the, is given for the benefit of everybody else. And, and that's why his sacrifice is, is supersedes every other sacrifice and it reaches for all people for all time. So what does Jesus do now? Hebrews tells us he lives on to pray for us. Did you know Jesus prays for you that your faith won't fail? Did you know that Jesus is a priest now in heaven? Did you know his sacrifice still pleads for our sin today? Did you know that in heaven this morning, Jesus is still there with holes in his hand? He is a human being in heaven. Now think about this, all right? When he went up to heaven and he ascended, people saw him going. How did he go? As a human being, as a sacrifice for our sin. He still had the holes in his hand. That's what, remember the story of, the, well, who was it? He said, I won't believe, Thomas, all right? Put your hands in. The resurrected body of Jesus still has holes and a, and a, a spear in the side. I, you know, he is in heaven today. So here's the amazing thing that Hebrews tells us. Not only is his sacrifice effectual or is, is the best and better than and for all time and was done once for all time, but it today acts on our behalf and a man is in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, that is amazing. You, you will read about that in no other place in the Bible other than this book of Hebrews. So we go, what does this mean? What does it mean that Jesus prays for me? What does it mean that this sacrifice is effectual for all time, for all sin of the world? What does it mean that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father? So what? here is the meaning of these wonderful words. It means that he understands you. This is where I'm going. It means that he is a human being who has lived and walked the dusty streets of our world. It means that he has suffered and know what suffering feels like. It means that he faced opposition and disappointment and he knows what you feel like when you face disappointment and suffering and unexpected things happen in your life. He is a human being in heaven. His sacrifice effectually is, th is the best for all time. He is the anchor of our soul. Um, when it says he cries with tears to the Father, chapter 5, verse 7, he understands how easy it is for us to lose our way. We flee to him for his refuge. He is the anchor of our soul. He has gone there for us. Therefore, I got up to the therefore. When we see a therefore in the Bible, what do we ask? What is the therefore, therefore? All right? That's all you're going to ever remember about me coming to this church. <laughs> what is the therefore, therefore? All right? I remember that. And, 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 you know, these chapters about Jesus as the high priest, this is what he's done, this is why his sacrifice is effectual, this is what, this is what he's doing now, he said, uh, you know, and then it goes, therefore. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm going, here is the turning moment of the book. Therefore, let us not give up. Let's stay on track. Let's persevere. You know, <laughs> tell me what you faced in your life that Jesus didn't face on the cross. Tell me what you faced in your life when he didn't face when all his friends and deserted, deserted him in the garden. Tell me what you're facing that he hasn't faced when he, when he sweated great drops of blood in the garden and said, Father, not my will, but yours. I mean, you know, here is, here is the Son of God who says, I know you, I've lived your life, I'm praying for you. Don't give up, okay? I mean, what a cool book. 
What an amazing thing. Don't give up. Therefore, don't give up. Therefore, don't turn back through unbelief like Israel did. Chapter 6, grumbling your way through life, complaining that you get a short straw, wanting to go back to the way things used to be. Don't turn back through bitterness that life has dealt you something and you go, well, that person hurt me or, or you know, ripped me off and, and don't get all bitter about it. There, Therefore, therefore, don't do that. You see? Don't turn back in boredom because life has become complacent. Two negatives and two positives. Chapter 6, chapter 10, chapter 11, therefore let us be inspired by those who have gone before. I'm going really fast because I'm running out of time. And therefore let us run well the race of life. The whole thing about the high priesthood and, and the sacrificial system and that Jesus supersedes all that's gone before is turnkeys on that therefore. The whole, the whole thing goes this and this and this and this and this and you're grafted in and you become the Jewish heritage and you are now reaching and, 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 you know, and therefore, therefore don't give up. Therefore don't turn back. Therefore be inspired. Therefore run well. The whole thing turns on that moment. And that's the message to us today. That, that when you struggle and when you fail and when you're disappointed, Jesus goes, I know about that. When you feel you know, you just want to give up or go back. Jesus says, I know what that's like. Father, bless my brother or my sister. I, I intercede for them right now. And, and you know, he's, he's going, okay, there's, the, there's this verse. Oh, this is good. I feel like this now. It, there's this verse that goes, and when he ascended to heaven, he sat down, didn't he, at the Father's right hand. Why does it go there? Because he's finished. He's finished the job. There's nothing else Jesus is doing other than coming back in power. And therefore, during this period, he sits down at the right hand of the Father and he prays for the church. And he prays for you and me. And he goes, Sister Jess, don't give up. Right? Jess with the brain injury. Uh, Sister Jess, I, I know what it's like to have trial and difficulty. I pray that your faith might not fail in the midst of this pain, okay? And every one of you, he prays for you. And he's seated. He's seated, which means I've got nothing else to do. I've done it all. I now have to just basically pray for you that your faith might not fail. I mean, you know, he said to Peter, didn't he? I've prayed for you that you won't give up. And, that, you know, Satan's asked to have you, but I've prayed for you. Um... We're up to the part about faith. I've got my wallet out. That's a good start. Um, faith. Chapter 11. Chapter 13. I, I, one of the things that I found about the, the issue of faith in the Bible is, um, is, you know, there's been lots of glib little things. One of the things that's helped me a little bit is faith means forsaking all else. I trust him. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all else. I trust him. And then that difficult verse, chapter 11, without faith it's impossible to please him. Uh, I, I'd like to rewrite that verse. I'd like you to rethink the word please. Because it's only mentioned once. But if you read the chapter of faith, the word receive is mentioned about five times. And, you know, sometimes in our exegesis, which means how we understand the Bible, we need to kind of think a little bit broader than one verse. Because faith is not the basis that we please God as though, you know, when I exercise God, God goes, well, you're doing really well. I'm pretty happy with you. I'll let you into my heaven. No, 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 don't go there. Faith is the basis that we receive anything from God. Okay. Why is it that way? Well, the answer is that you can't buy God's goodness. You can't earn it and you can't trade it. So there's really nothing you bring to the equation. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, even as good as all of you are, think you are, with all your things that you can offer God, you've got nothing to give him. You can only receive what he gives you. And what is the what do you bring to the mix? What do you need to bring? And the answer is faith. Now, I bought a lot. <laughs> this is a real one. This is a hundred yuan, uh, whatever's they got. That, was, that wasn't very 
tactful, was it? A hundred Chinese yuan. When I was last in China many years ago, I didn't spend it all. And I had, a, I had this left over. This is a real one. This, is, this, is, this will work in China, but it won't work here. And what I want to say to you this morning, I want you to understand about faith. Faith is the currency of the heavens. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. If you get anything, it's because of faith. Now, if I, if I use this here in New Zealand, it's worth pretty much nothing. All right? It's only worth something in China. And it's worth 100 whatever. Probably not a lot. But there you go. It's worth something in China. Now, faith is worth something in the kingdom when you exercise it. It's the basis upon which you get something from God. You bring nothing other than your life to God and say, God, here it is. I give it to you. I, by faith, receive what you've given me. And that, friends, that just puts every one of us on the same pathway and on the same level. No matter how gifted you are, no matter what you've got, no matter what your wealth, your history, your problems, your journey, your life, your failures, every one of us come to the same basis to God. And he ever lives to pray for you. And by faith, you receive what God's given. Now, it sounds difficult, but it's very simple. And then chapter 12 and 11 is a list of people who exercised faith in God. Enoch walked right into heaven. Noah built a boat on dry ground, and the people mocked him. But what did he do? He received from God because he obeyed what God spoke to him, even though no one listened. They laughed at him. They mocked him. But he went about doing it. Abraham looked for a land which was to come, started out not knowing where to go. He kind of went on a journey, and he said, God, I'll trust you to show me as I go. He received the journey and the land of Israel because he obeyed God. He received from God because he exercised faith. Sarah received a baby in her own age because she exercised faith, even though she didn't when she first heard the news, which is pretty obvious. So would you. You'd laugh too. Abraham offered up Isaac, believing God would provide or raise him from the dead. Jacob blessed his family. I've got no time to go into all these, but every one of these received from God because they exercised faith. Joseph said, when I die, I want you to bury my bones up, not in Egypt where he was, but up in the land of promise. Because I believe that we're going to be back there one day. All right? So that was a statement of faith. And he received the answer because he exercised faith. Moses preferred poverty to the prosperity of, of, of where he was brought up in the palace. I mean, goes on. Joshua saw the walls of Jericho come down when, when only a miracle would do it. Damp, Samson, David, the prophets, Gideon, all these. Yet Now, this is where I want to go. None of these received everything God had. There was something better that God had for them, and his name was Jesus. And you guys and me stand in the receiving benefit of the history of all these people who by faith walked with God, and then Jesus came, and we are grafted into that whole thing. And then Jesus came, and we get the new covenant. So, friends, Faith is the currency of heaven. Anything you get. So that's why we prayed for Jess this morning and we received God's best for her. Right? See that? It was a different word. I mean, sometimes when you're sick, we go, God, will you heal this person? That's okay too. But, but is a better language. Lord God, we believe as a father that you want to bless this young woman with health. We receive your answer by faith. We thank you that in faith you are going to give it because you're good. And we thank you that in faith we can receive your blessing. That is a more biblical prayer in a sense. You know what I mean? Because we are exercising faith and we are receiving from God and stating what we would like to happen. Okay. So friends, don't give up on Jesus because he won't give up on you. The book finishes with us being cheered on to run the race well. I read a book recently, no, it wasn't recently, years ago called The Applause of Heaven. It's a great book. And it speaks about coming around the final bend. You know, the Olympics are coming, it's coming soon. Oh, my goodness me, what a topic. Anyway, I won't go there. And, 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 you know, these guys are going to be running. They're coming around the final bend. Are they going to make it? Who's going to win? And there's this kind of rampant race to the tape. And this is the picture of Hebrews, that, you know, you're on a race, you're running, and will you finish? There's the question. Or are you going to fall over? 
Are you going to trip up? Are you going to give up? Are you just going to kind of sit down on the side and say, I've had enough? I've been disappointed, frustrated, whatever, too long. The book of Hebrews says Jesus understands you. Don't give up on Jesus. He's not given up on you. Last week I told you about my discussion with Bob the upholsterer. When he said to me, Lord, you know I'm hoping that doing this work for you will get me to heaven. Classic. No, Bob, it won't. There is only one thing that will get you to heaven, and that's to trust in the saving work of Jesus the greatest. Greater than angels, greater than creation, greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than all the greatest Jesus, our high priest, who sits this morning in heaven with scars from earth and says, Father, bring them home. Lord, I feel like I've rushed through this and haven't done a great job. But some, some part of this, will you inspire us to trust you to not give up? Thank you that you've reminded us that you're in heaven. You're praying for us. You understand our fragility. You understand how easily led astray we are. You understand how so often we want to give up. You understand the pain of our lives and the trial and the disappointment. And you pray for us. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus, that by your Holy Spirit, you strengthen us to face life and to run to the tape. Thank you, Lord, that our bodies might be giving up and things don't work like they used to, but we keep running. Because of the joy that is set before us, we go through whatever until we finish the race. Lord God, I pray for every person here this morning that heard this message. Lord, every one of us, in a sense, love you. We know you. I thank you that you've stretched our Christology from beginning to end today. And we've seen the person and the purpose of Jesus from the beginning of time. Creator, incredible, magnificent creator, but greater than a creation. Greater than the angels, greater than the prophets, greater than the message, greater than all. And seated at the Father's right hand where he's finished his job. Thank you that he's done this for us. And now we can simply say, yes, I would love it. Thank you, I receive by faith every blessing that you want me to have. Now, Lord, will you dismiss us with your blessing, I pray. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for our church family. Go with us. Encourage us more in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, anybody off to China? Uh, come and get this. Yeah, uh, communion. Yeah, we're going to do it. <laughs> now, this is going to be the fastest communion you've ever done, all right? But it, it won't be, because actually the message of Hebrews is right on this topic, okay? So today, Father, when we receive this little drink, it's the new deal of Jesus. It's, it's, the, it's the body and the blood of Jesus, the sacrificial lamb of God, effectually offered to us today. Thank you that this sacrifice pleads for us right now before the Father. It is unfinished in a sense. It is still working. It's still operating. And it will do until we walk into heaven one day. Now, Father, we receive this bread and this drink as a symbol of your love, and we drink and we eat it together as a family of God, strengthening one another, encouraging other all the more, in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll be served. Uh, uh, um, how would you like to do this? Come forward as easy as. Come forward and take a cup, go back to your seat, sit down and drink it, and, and just have fellowship with the people around you. I want to pray for the lunch today right now too. Father God, thank you for our fellowship, for our volunteers. Thank you for the lunch that the team have prepared for us today. Thank you that we can now enjoy encouraging each other. Lord, I want us to tell stories of your goodness in our lives. Let them flow today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you that this is all about you, Jesus. Amen. Come forward, take a cup, back to your seat, sit down, pray, have some fellowship with the people around you, and then I'll close the service. Um, after we've had some time to do that.
that's why the message of Jesus salvation as our high priest is very simple it says a child can understand Everyone that comes to God must come through the same simple way. Now, Father, dismiss us with your blessing. Thank you, thank you for this amazing gift that you've given us, the gift of life, Thank you for the trials and difficulties that one day we'll understand what it was all about. Meanwhile, we trust you. Thank you that you are a father of love, that you give good gifts to your children. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our sacrifice and our high priest that prays that our faith might not fail. Thank you that you are a good, good God. Thank you that you love us this morning so much and you don't want us to give up. So God, we're going to go on until one day we walk right into heaven. Now bless our lunch and our time together. Thank you for those that have prepared it. Thank you for all our volunteers in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Will you go through into the cafe and have a seat at a table. You'll be served on your table and just go through. And the hall area has tables as well and it's warmer in there.